Paul says to the Thessalonians, Antichrist has not yet come, but there is a time when he will be revealed. For now he is being restrained, and you know what restrains him. That's an interesting statement. And you know what restrains him now, or literally, and now that which is restraining him you know. How did they know? How did they know what restrains him? If you were to pick up Bible commentary on Second Thessalonians today and you were to read some offerings about this verse, you would probably find people bouncing around on eight different opinions about what restrains the Antichrist. How did they know? Well, I'll tell you how they knew. Paul had told them. When he was with them, he told them. We can only wish that he had repeated it here, but he didn't. He just says, you know. And so we're all saying, right, they know, but are we sure? How did they know? He taught them when he was with them. It was information well known to them, if not to us. That which is restraining, notice it there. Literally, the verb means to hold down or to hold back. And so he says, you know what the restraining force is. It is in the neuter here. So here you're talking about a force. We have all kinds of suggestions. Some say that what restrains the coming of Antichrist is the preaching of the gospel, and that the gospel will be preached, and as long as the gospel is being preached, it holds Antichrist in check. As long as men preach the gospel, he is restrained. And finally, when the gospel is fully preached and needs to be preached no longer, then the restraint will be off. Some say it is the Jewish state. It is the state of Israel that restrains. Some say it is the binding of Satan that is going on today among believers as they go around binding Satan. They are restraining him. Some say it is the church. The church restrains him by its influence in the world as salt and light. Some say it is human government, that God having ordained human government, human government uh, being diverse and uh, controlled by a myriad of people uh, seems to be restraining him because of its own power. He can't take over because government is strong. Some say it is a principle of law or a principle of morality that sort of uh, has effused itself into the fabric of the world. And so this principle of morality uh, restrains Antichrist from letting all hell break loose. Some used to teach that it was the Roman Empire, that the Roman Empire itself was the single government that held back the coming of Antichrist. And then some have suggested that it could be an angel, and even specifically, it could be Michael. Michael the angel uniquely is mentioned in Daniel in a way that uh, could lead somebody to conclude that. I'll just tell you the verse. I think it's Daniel 10.21. Now having said all of that, I just want you to know that I don't think any of those is correct. First of all, all of those with the exception of Michael are human. They are all human. Humans preach the gospel. Humans are making up the Jewish state. Humans are running around trying to bind Satan. Human beings make up the church, human government, the principle of law and morality that is part of human social life. The Roman Empire is made up of human beings. And it is hard for me to imagine that any human effort at all could restrain the supernatural power of Satan in releasing the Antichrist. Further. Even though, take for example the, what you would assume would be the best of those choices would be the church, and you might assume that the church would be the best restrainer. Certainly human government doesn't restrain things in all cases. Certainly it doesn't necessarily restrain evil and give place to good. We wouldn't want to say too much about the principle of morality since our culture knows absolutely nothing about it. We wouldn't want to make uh, virtuous the Jewish state or the Roman Empire. So the best choice, you say, would be the church. The problem with that is that even the church, as salt and light, doesn't restrain evil. It may restrain evil to some extent in the lives of its people, but it has not been successful in restraining evil in the lives of people outside of it. 
The world continues to get worse and worse. Evil men, says Second Timothy, grow worse and worse. And there is no reason to assume that the church has some kind of power in and of itself to restrain satanic plans for the ungodly. And of course, as I mentioned, some of the, some of the folks in these institutions that, that, that are offered as uh, the restrainer aren't even Christians, let alone spiritually strong. And the Roman Empire at this moment is dead, and though it will be revived in the future, its revival has nothing to do with spiritual power. Human forces deal with human issues, not supernatural issues. Human forces, human power, human ingenuity, human society, human institutions do not cope well with supernatural forces. So there is a power in operation, and it has to be a supernatural power. It has to be dealing on another level, not just an earthly one. And it is retarding Satan from pulling off his plan with a final antichrist. And then he says in verse 7, only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. The mystery will not be fully revealed until he who restrains is taken out of the way. Now here's a very important change. In verse 6, what restrains was neuter. Now we have he who restrains. We've moved from a neuter, a force, to a masculine, a person. And I believe this is a good indication that there is a person here, that there is a supernatural person who is exerting the force in verse 6. There is a force that restrains, but there is a he who exercises that force. Who is it? I believe the best understanding would lead us to believe it is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the person who exerts the force that holds back Satan. In Genesis chapter 6, there's an important verse, verse 3, then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever. What you have here is a, is a concept, the Holy Spirit battling against wicked men. And God says, my spirit isn't going to do that forever. My spirit isn't going to fight your wickedness forever. It wasn't long until He drowned them all, right? And I think you have there the, the work of the Holy Spirit that is a restraining work. The Holy Spirit was, was battling against the flood of wickedness in the ancient world. In Acts chapter 7, one other verse that shows us the Spirit's ministry in this kind of area, in Acts seven fifty one, you men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. Now here again you have the Holy Spirit battling against sin, battling against iniquity, battling against evil, trying to restrain, as John tells us, to convict in John 16. So we have a number of passages in which the Holy Spirit is seen dealing with sin, wrestling with sin, confronting sin, convicting of sin, restraining sin, no doubt. He could be assisted by Michael, but Michael is not omnipresent. And Michael is limited because he is a created angel. I wouldn't argue that he may use someone like Michael, an angel like Michael or other holy angels, but I believe it is the Holy Spirit who is the restrainer. Now please note, the Holy Spirit's restraint will go on until halfway through the time called the tribulation. The period called the Great Tribulation is the second half of the seven years. The Holy Spirit restrains until the midpoint, and then He allows the Antichrist to go into the temple, do the abomination, bring the apostasy, and then the horrors described in the book of Revelation take place, which lead to the day of the Lord. So that restraint will go on until the man of sin is revealed in God's perfect time. The Holy Spirit then, I believe, 
is most likely the restrainer because it must be a supernatural being. The Holy Spirit is the one most frequently associated with dealing with sin, restraining, convicting. And we could see it as a neuter because there is a force that He exerts and as a masculine because He is a person. By the way, as a footnote for you that are interested, in the upper room discourse, Jesus spoke about the Holy Spirit. And in that discourse as He spoke about the Holy Spirit, interestingly enough, He fluctuated between the neuter and the masculine genders. If you study the Greek text of the upper room discourse, John 13 to 17, you'll see Him fluctuate between the neuter and the masculine, referring to the Holy Spirit, depending upon whether He was using a gender to agree with a grammatical term or whether He was using a gender to emphasize personality. So the Holy Spirit can be spoken of in the neuter. After all, pneuma, the Greek word for spirit, is neuter. He can be spoken of in the masculine when He is identified as a person. So that's not an unfamiliar thing in Scripture. So I would take it that the Holy Spirit is preventing Satan from the full, final lawlessness under Antichrist until God's perfect time. And it has to be in God's time because He has to redeem the church that is ordained from before the foundation of the world. He has to accomplish all that that involves. Now then note, please, this has nothing to do with the rapture of the church. Some people have said the Holy Spirit restrains, but when the church is raptured, the Holy Spirit living in the church is taken away, and then the man of sin is revealed. That is not the case. The man of sin is not revealed until the midpoint of the seven years. So the Holy Spirit is restraining all the way into the midpoint until the abomination of desolation. So if we are to affirm that the church is raptured, before the seven years begins, the Holy Spirit continues to restrain until the midpoint. You cannot therefore use the removal of the restrainer as evidence of the pre-tribulation rapture. Because if you believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, you have the church taken away on the basis of Revelation 3, kept from the hour that comes to try the earth. That's probably the key passage teaching a pre-trib rapture, but you've still got the Holy Spirit restraining until halfway through the period of tribulation. Please notice in verse 7, the one who restrains is taken out of the way. Just a footnote, that does not mean he is removed from the world. It doesn't mean that. That doesn't mean that he's taken into heaven. Listen, in the first place, the Holy Spirit is omnipresent, right? So he has to be everywhere. In the second place, people are going to be saved during this time, and nobody is saved who isn't begotten again by the Spirit. So the idea that the Holy Spirit leaves is not true. What happens is the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way in terms of blocking Satan, in terms of his restraining ministry. So the Holy Spirit is simply taken out of the way as a restrainer, removed as a roadblock, not removed from the world or no one could be saved or, and God wouldn't be affecting His purposes and His plans. So we don't want to make too much out of that. It is the Holy Spirit. He is not removed from the world, or there could be no evangelization by the 144,000. There could be no comprehension of the gospel because the Spirit has to quicken the mind. There could be no conversion because He alone is the one who gives eternal life. So He has to be here doing His work. He just stops the restraining part of it. William Hendrickson writes an interesting paragraph summing this up. Accordingly, the sense of the entire passage in verses 6 and 7 seems to be this. Satan, while perfectly aware of the fact that he cannot himself become incarnate, nevertheless would like to imitate the second person of the Trinity also in this respect as far as possible. He yearns for a man over whom he will have complete control and who will perform his will as thoroughly as Jesus performed the will of the Father. It will have to be a man of outstanding talents, but as yet the devil is being frustrated in his attempt to put this plan into operation. Someone and something is always holding back the deceiver's man of lawlessness. This, of course, happens under God's direction. Hence, for the time being, the worst Satan can do is to promote the spirit of lawlessness. But this does not satisfy him. It is as if he and his man of sin bide their time. At the divinely decreed moment, when as a punishment for man's willingness to cooperate with this spirit, the someone and the something that now holds back is removed, then Satan will begin to carry out his plans." End quote. The something is a supernatural force. The someone who exerts it is the Holy Spirit. 